All right, welcome all. I have with me Victoria Ziavara and her project, which is identifying stormwater management tools for nonprofit organizations. So sit back and enjoy. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Victoria Ziavara. Like he said, my project is identifying stormwater management tools for nonprofit organizations. Uh, so, how I picked my topic, after taking ISAT 320, I found a passion for water and learning about how it affects the environment. Uh, so I initially planned on doing a project in Harrisonburg looking at Black's Run, and that's an already polluted stream in Harrisonburg, uh, but later learned about how development impacts the waterways, so I changed my direction to focus on stormwater management and how to prevent further degradation. Um, so as cities grow, <coughs> there is a demand for expansion to accommodate for the population and needs of the people. This leads to more impervious surfaces and an increase in stormwater runoff. As you can see in this image, 90% of the water in a natural setting either goes into the ground or gets evaporated, while only 10% goes into the local waters. Um, and then as in the other side, an urbanized area, not as much can go into the ground, so a majority of it goes into the local waters. Um, so <coughs> the natural setting is an ideal process because it allows water to enter back into the ground so groundwater supply and filters out pollutants. For heavily urbanized areas, um, very little stormwater can enter the ground, so a majority of it goes into local waters and it can harm the ecosystems. Um, so with an increased volume of runoff going into local waters, it can have serious impacts on the health of the ecosystem. Bank erosion increases and runoff carries pollutants such as nutrients, sediments, bacteria into the waterways. And these issues can happen throughout all watersheds, but I was focusing in Harrisonburg. Um, so Harrisonburg is about 17.4 square miles and has a or had a population of about 49,000 people as of 2010. Uh, the city has a large amount of impervious surfaces, with some of the largest contributors being roads, commercial, industrial, and residential areas. Um, as you can see in the image, the middle, this is JMU, with the magenta being commercial areas, and then the red, orange, and yellow areas being residential. <coughs> the stormwater in the city drains into six sub-watersheds with the largest being Black's Run. 66% 66 of, 66 of the stormwater in the city flows into Black's Run. Um, so Black's Run is about 22 miles long with a drainage area of about 55 square miles. The stream flows through the city until it enters Rockingham County where it will meet, meet Cooks Creek and enter into the, into the North River which ultimately goes to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the image shows Black's Run going through the city with the orange lines being its watershed boundaries. The, the Black Run watershed is 65% urban residential, which has led to the stream being included on the EPA's impaired waters list for fecal coliform, E. coli, benthic macroinvertebrates, um, and benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, with stormwater causing impairments to Black Run, it brings up the question of where does stormwater go in Harrisonburg? Uh, so in Harrisonburg, like many other cities, stormwater goes into an underground storm sewer system called a municipal, or yeah, underground sewer system called a municipal separate storm sewer system, or MS4. Uh, unlike sanitary waste, which goes into a wastewater treatment plant before entering local waters again, stormwater in an MS4 goes untreated from sewers to the local water. This is an important part of the system because stormwater that would normally be qualified as a non-point source because there's not a direct location for where it comes from now becomes a point source because there is a pipe where polluted water is dumped. In the figure on the right, it shows the different paths of sanitary waste going to the treatment plant and the stormwater going directly to the local water. In Harrisonburg, there are multiple outfall locations where the stormwater is being released into Black's Run. This leads to regulations for the discharge entering the wastewater or the water at each location and brought about MS4 permits. MS4 regulations required cities to get permits that allowed them to discharge stormwater into local waters. These permits are issued by the Environmental Protection Agency and are monitored by the states to ensure they are being enforced. If the states are not doing a good job at enforcing these regulations, then the EPA will step in and take action that could end up finding the city if changes are not being made. These permits are designed to control the discharge of pollutants to meet the water quality standards set by the Clean Water Act. These permits are based on population size and sizes of facilities, so because of this, uh, because, so because of its size and amount of impervious surface, JMU has its own MS4 that is separate from the cities. This led to higher water quality due to efforts re to reduce pollutants flowing into local waters. Harrisburg's MS4 was established in 2003 and is a general permit which requires there be a stormwater management plan that includes six minimum control measures. These include public education and outreach, public participation and involvement, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site stormwater runoff control, post-construction stormwater management, and pollution prevention and good housekeeping. 
The public education and involvement includes distributing educational materials to citizens while encouraging them to participate in stormwater management programs. Illicit discharge detection and elimination is developing a plan to locate all legal discharge locations. <coughs> construction runoff control focused on erosion and sediment control while post-construction involves implementing projects to minimize runoff. Finally, pollution prevention and good housekeeping involve programs with prevention techniques that will eliminate runoff to meet the goal of reducing runoff. The points that were most important when dealing with this project are the public education involvement and the good housekeeping. When considering ways for the city to make improvements regarding stormwater runoff, all options cost money, so city officials created a way to get, to get landowners to help pay. The way city officials got landowners involved was by creating a stormwater utility fee. This fee charges all properties $6 per 500 square feet of impervious surfaces. Fees can range anywhere from $17,000 for large properties such as Valley Mall to around $40 for an average household. Every property must pay this fee, but the fee includes a credit program that provides incentives to reduce runoff by following those good housekeeping measures mentioned in the MS4 permits. By implementing good housekeeping measures, landowners can reduce their fee up to 50%. These can include multiple best management practices, or BMPs, based on the size of the property and the money available to spend. Each BMP correlates to amount of runoff reduced and an amount of money saved. However, the credit program guidelines differ for residential and non-residential properties. Residential properties are identified as individual homeowners, while non-residential properties can be industries, businesses, uh, nonprofits, and religious organizations. Non-residential properties are often thought of as large businesses with large amounts of impervious surfaces, but people don't always think of the smaller nonprofits that fall under the same category. <clears throat> the biggest difference between the properties is that nonprofits and religious organizations often have less money to spend on implementing BMPs to reduce their fee, but have large buildings and parking lots. This slide lists out some of the potential BMPs for property to implement uh, that will reduce their runoff and ultimately a fee. There are a wide range of smaller projects, while some of them cost more money and are more complex, such as green roofs. The purpose of this project was to focus on religious organizations, since they often have large parking lots, with, which leads to large amounts of impervious surfaces and a higher fee. IU Synagogue Beth L is a case study to find ways to reduce runoff on their property and involve the congregation to meet the MS4 permit requirements of public education and involvement. By working with Beth L, I was able to help the synagogue find ways to reduce run their runoff while also supporting the city trying to meet their permit needs. Bethel is an almost four acre plot of land with multiple different land uses. As seen in the image, they have the building and then to the right is the parking lot. They have a lot of open land and an even larger amount of forest area. Um, the property has about 22,000 square feet of impervious surfaces or the equivalent of about half an acre, which makes their current stormwater fee about $264 a year. These are just some pictures of the property closer up. The first three are of the native gardens planted around the building. Uh, the other pictures are the open land, the edge of the forest, and then there's an orchard that's been there for about eight years. Um, so when considering the best options for Bethel, there are five criteria that were important to the Bethel community. The cost must not be that big initially, and the reduction of the fee from implementing any of these projects must be made back fairly quickly. The complexity of the projects must not be so complicated that they cannot be completed by the synagogue and volunteers without the need for contractors. The cost or the ease of maintenance, how much needs to be done for the upkeep of these projects over the years, the attractiveness, will it add to the property and catch the attention of passersby, and finally, engagement of the community, can the synagogue and its volunteers be included in the project and will it be a learning tool? Uh, so based on those five criteria, I came up with four suggestions for Bethel, which would be disconnecting downspouts, adding rain barrels, planting a swale, and planting a rain garden. So the first suggestion is disconnecting downspouts. Uh, disconnecting, uh, as seen in the image of Bethel, there are a total of 12 downspouts connected to the building, with seven of those being disconnected already, and the other five still connected to the underground, underground storm sewer system. An example of a disconnected downspout can be seen on the right. The process of disconnecting the remaining downspouts involves cutting the current piping to attach an angle piece that will take the water away from the building. Based on the area of the roof and the annu at average annual rainfall of Harrisburg, it can be calculated that a total of around 202,000 gallons of water, storm water would be diverted to the grass instead of the <clears throat> instead of entering directly into the stormwater system. This would cost about twenty dollars per downspout, and the five remaining could be completed within a day. The second suggestion is rain barrels. 
Rain barrels attach to the downspouts from the roof and store the, rain the runoff instead of letting it flow into the storm sewer system or ground. The stormwater is stored in the barrels and can be used at a later date. These are most beneficial placed near your garden because as we seen in the image, the water in the barrels can be used instead of the hose, which would use less city water and could reuse the stormwater. Um, Rain barrels are relatively inexpensive and can be even cheaper if purchased through a rain barrel workshop, such as the one that's being held May 3rd by the Soil and Water Conservation District. One of the best benefits of rain barrels is that they can be decorative additions to properties that are an obvious statement of their commitment to improving the environment. The location shown above is the front of Beth L and will be seen by everyone that passes by. The third suggestion is a swale. Swales are linear, shallow stretches of land planted with native plants that are flood and erosion tolerant. The plants absorb the stormwater and reduce the amount of runoff going into storm trains. <clears throat> this addition would be most useful in the location above because it is between the building and the parking lot. The grassy area is sloped on one side which leads to puddling as well as the extra stormwater coming from the parking lot that is also sloped to the left. The area would also have three downspouts bringing in more water to the area. The two downspouts are located on the wall and there's an extra, or there's a third downspout on the front of the building that could be directed towards that area. <clears throat> because this is basically a garden, it would be an attractive addition to the land and require little maintenance. This is a more complex project than the previous two, but the cost would be relatively low maintenance because the main components would be plants and labor, but the labor would be done by volunteers. So the final suggestion is a rain garden. Rain gardens are similar to swales in that they are shallow depressions planted with native species, but rain gardens can be any shape and are more complex. The rain gardens capture the stormwater, which allows for the water to infiltrate into the ground instead of going to storm drains. The three components of a good rain garden are native plants because they are better adapted to climate, three zones which will separate the plants based on their tolerance for flooding conditions, and, and rocks for the inflows and outflows to slow down the velocity of the water. The image in the top right shows the slope design of the garden, which helps separate the garden into three zones. The deepest zone in the center must be planted with the most flood tolerant plants, and the higher sections should be more drought tolerant because they will receive the least amount of water. In the second picture, it is easier to see the berm or raised edge of the garden. This prevents the stormwater from leaving the garden if there, are heavy rain, if there is a heavy rain. One important consideration for adding rocks uh, to the garden at Bethel is making sure the rocks are large enough to prevent the children from throwing them. Uh, at Bethel, the rain garden size was based on drainage area and slope. With the drainage area of about 5,000 square feet and a relatively flat slope, the rain garden would have to be 1,500 square feet with a depth of three to five inches. The picture in the bottom right shows the best location for the garden, but it might not have the space for such a large garden, so the size could be shrunk to fit the area. Since rain gardens are the most complex, they would have the highest cost due to the need for extra materials such as mulch, rocks, and any soil additives. Although the cost would be higher, they are, there are grants available through the Soil and Water Conservation District that could be applied for, but the application process requires an engineer's signature. Since doing all this research, I have presented my ideas to the board of directors at the synagogue and they have expressed interest in these projects. I have started looking into the paperwork to receive the grant money as well as how to apply for the credit program. <coughs> Although I did not get a chance to physically see any of these projects being done, I have outlined the whole process in my paper to hopefully assist other nonprofits in their attempt to reduce runoff and their fee. In conclusion, uh, implementing stormwater management techniques will reduce the amount of runoff from Bethel or from the Bethel property and reduce stormwater fees. Uh, these projects will get the community more involved and represent an example of good stewardship desired by the MS4 permits. Okay, finally I'd like to thank Bethel for allowing me to use their property, uh, Keith Thomas and Emily Riggleman from the Soil Water Conservation District for coming to the temple and doing a walkthrough to help us find the, po the best possible su uh, suggestions, Dr. Bensing for helping me find information on Black's Run, and Dr. Hanley for working with me the past year. Questions? with so many words so quickly. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 264 dollars. So mm -hmm. how did they calculate that? I mean, do you have a sense? And, and, and I guess the, the, the follow-up question would be, how much would it be reduced for a rain barrel or a disconnected? Mm -hmm. So it's the $6 for every 500 square feet. And they have like a mapping tool, which I think is GIS based. So online, you can look up your address and find it. And they have like an outline of the total building. So it's like the roof, the driveway. I think they have like the sidewalk also listed. Um, and I don't know the exact amount for like the rain barrels or rain gardens or anything, but they have work or the application process online that you can like figure out how much you would reduce based on like the size and how many you're doing. 
So, so I don't have the like rain barrel is like sixty dollars. So hopefully, if they could save you know twenty dollars, they would pay that off. In yeah. Three years or something. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get to any of like the exact numbers. Uh -huh. Did, how how much can one of those swales handle? I, we just had a nice rain last week. All the streams went up a lot. We got 2.6 inches. You know what you got in your yard? About that much. About that That's much. So, how much volume of water can a swale or a rain garden actually capture in, in, in the design like you made for the? It depends on the size of them, because I know the rain gardens, you're supposed to make it so that it's about the third of the drainage area. So I'm not sure how much that would, would come out to in terms of like the volume of water, but it's supposed, to, I don't, yeah, I don't have like an, an okay. idea for that. The big difference between the two is the rain garden is designed to get three to five inches deep, but be able to drain within, mm -hmm. what, 24 hours, 48 yeah. hours? 24 to 48. The swale is just kind of Slow catching it and slowing it down. So there's there's a natural flow there that will, will go on back towards the forest. Mm -hmm. So you said you presented it to the board of directors? Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming these folks are not stormwater engineers. So to, can you just give us a sense of how they received it, what kinds of questions they asked? And well, I know at first they were kind of on like kind of questioning it because you said like they don't want to have a lot of extra work so like with the mowing for the area they were kind of questioning the swale because they would be just in the middle kind of but dr haley actually talked to them more and they figured out if they have like mulch area and then just add the swale to the middle kind of they can mow around it so it isn't as much of a nuisance um so i think for the most part they were interested in learning especially because the rain barrels would be such an easy like they could go i think dr haley wants to take one of the students with her so it's kind of like a learning experience in that sense. So I think a lot of the projects they were interested in, especially because like the downspout disconnecting is very cheap and easy. So that's not something that would really require a lot of work. Uh, so overall, I think they were pretty interested. And the maintenance question is one that comes up a lot when you're dealing with rain yeah. gardens and swales and practices that aren't just mowing your lawn. Mm -hmm. So we've had the same experience with Jane. Trying to encourage that. The, um, the slide with your pictures from the, the property. These? Yeah, so I think you can already see that we don't have the, the typical um, three bushes that are shaped like circles and two two pieces of pampas grass and whatnot. We we already have. There had, is some gardening going on. Yes, and and, and there there is a great deal of thought about how to make a statement of replenishing the earth. So it, it's not gonna be a hard sell. Mm -hmm. No? No more questions? All right, and let's give it up.